thank you so much for joining us this evening. And can I wish you all a very happy National Tree Week. A huge thank you to all our volunteer tree wardens and our young tree champions and our Jubilee partners who've been out planting this week and caring for trees and to all our amazing supporters across the UK and far beyond. My name is Sarah Lom and I'm CEO of the Tree Council, which is a national charity that brings everybody together for the love of trees. And here with me tonight from Team Tree Council are John Stokes, our Director of Tree Science and Research, and Dominic Quinn, uh, who's in charge of all the technology, and Claire Bowen, also behind the scenes, our Director of Comms uh, and Projects. Uh, I will come to our very special guest in just a moment. It's been an amazing National Tree Week so far. We've planted a wonderful Miyawaki forest and coppiced 100 metres of hedgerow in Petersfield. And yesterday, we welcomed our royal patron, HRH, the Duke of Kent, to plant a plum tree right in the heart of London. It was a special variety, a new variety, in honour of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, which we planted with the Grenfell community on the Lancaster West estate. And this morning, John and I were out. Um, we were planting with 60 children from six schools, planting a new orchard with apple trees whose history dates back a hundred years or more. Lots of other people all across the country as well planting too. Uh, but for our online series this National Tree Week, we decided to focus our attention not on what's happening overground, but on the hidden connections that lie beneath. We so often look up at the sky and we completely forget to explore what's going on at ground level or underneath, that symbiotic relationship between trees and their neighbours. So tonight we're focusing on fungi and we feel very honoured to have Professor Martin Bidartondo join us to help untangle this fabulously complex world. Martin is Professor of Molecular Ecology in the Department of Natural Sciences at Imperial College. He's also a research associate at Kew, and his experience stretches back through the universities of California and Alaska. Every day, he explores the world of mycorrhizas or fungus roots with his team, doing groundbreaking research on the ecology of heathlands and woodlands, especially underground. Before we hear from Professor Bidatondo, one bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, do please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat box. John is going to help sift and sort them, and we'll do our best to answer some of them at least at the end. And now I'm going to invite you to settle back comfortably as Professor Bidatondo tells us about the ancient symbioses between plants and fungi. Over to you, Martin. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to the Tree Council. And here we go. So hopefully you can see that. Good. So, so I've added in a changing world to the title. Um, so fungi and trees working together in a changing world. And as you will see, that is sort of a, a running theme here. Um, we are talking about um, from the very, very distant past into the present. So um, let me get my pointer in here. And um, so, so let's get to it. So I've uh, divided this up into four sections um, and they are linked, uh, but they're quite different. So hopefully you will find at least some of this uh, interesting. So to start with interactions, um, the, the original meaning of uh, the word competition um comes from the latin to for meeting or coming together to agree or to coincide um and that changes uh during the middle ages and this becomes associated with striving for a limited resource which could be the hand of a maiden or, or a price and, and in some ways this this carries on to the very present uh, in in primary schools we still teach our students about uh, the ecological pyramid. So it's all about producers and consumers. And that reflects some of the things that, you know, go on in our society. Um, it's, you know, th this kind of system is uh, really quite basic. You know, this ignores things like recycling. You know, this this would not be very sustainable, this, this kind of setup. Um, now things have uh, moved on. Uh, now we get into the 1870s. Um, and there's discussion about uh, this, this idea of organisms interacting 
living together, coexisting. Um, and this word symbiosis, which is now very widely used, uh, is coined uh, by uh, scientists working on plants and fungi. And um, the, the original definition that, that uh, Anton de Barry pro produced is unlike organisms living together. And I think this is quite, quite nice. It's very open. It doesn't really tell us whether they get along or not, um, but it, they do coexist in some way. So the, the systems that have classic systems that have been studied in, in this context have been lichens here, uh, mycorrhizae, and uh, endophytes. So today we're going to be focusing on these ones. Okay. Um, also in the 1870s, uh, this is a time of quite a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of inequality in society. Uh, there's uh, Marxism is, is being uh, described. Uh, there's anarchist, socialist. There's a lot going on. Um, and some of this, there's some exchange between science and society in this, in this kind of uh, area. And um, biologists at around that time are talking about a special type of symbiosis, which is called mutualism, where it's unlike organisms are actually helping each other out. Okay. Um, we fast forward into the 1950s, and there's a, a formal definition from uh, biologists about cooperation. And this is an optional uh, beneficial interaction. This is where you, you sort of choose to engage or not. And more recently, um, uh, plant ecologists in particular talk about facilitation. Um, and this is the idea of one, the, the, the growth of one organism enhances the growth of another, but this is sort of a byproduct. It's not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, there's not necessarily something given back. Um, from the bottom here, you can see that this is a very popular topic in science. There's a whole lot of very technical books about these kinds of uh, ideas. So if you are more interested in reading about this, there is plenty for you out there. Um, so that we switch gears a little bit, but we keep that idea of, of symbiosis um, and mutualism together. And we're going to talk about greening. And this is really the big greening of the earth, okay? The conquest of land by plants. Um, and so we are going to um, have to use our imagination. Uh, we wish we had a time machine like this, but we don't. Um, and so I'm going to take you back, way back. So now we are talking um, the Ordovician period, so maybe 500 million years ago. Um, in, in the seas, there is been quite a lot of diversification. So there are really big, complex organisms living in the water, but the land remains barren. Uh, there are microbes um, living on the surfaces, dry surfaces, but there is really not much else. Uh, it's really only on in the water that you find really big, complicated organisms. Um, there's a very long delay, about 70 million years, until we get places that start to look like a modern kind of ecosystem where there are shrubs and there are maybe even some trees. Um, so it's quite a long delay and the, the delay is basically because it's dry. It's just really terrible to be living in a place where there is no water, where nutrients don't just diffuse towards your body. You have to go and get them somehow. And fungi are definitely part of the story, even though as is typical for the fungi, they are sort of out of sight and maybe out of mind, but they are there and we will get to that. Um, if we then fast forward to the very present, um, we have sort of three major types of, of worlds that are with us. Um, and these ones up here, this is from the highlands in Scotland. This is dominated by plants that require very wet environments. Uh, they are small, things like mosses, liverworts, hornworts. Um, what we are mostly familiar with are these other kinds of environments. It's a heathland, for instance. Uh, so this is dominated by flowering plants and sometimes some conifers. Um, and then very, very recently, about 2000 years ago, we started creating these new ecosystems uh, that are agroecosystems. And this is where we have monocultures of just a very, very small number of flowering plants that we use for our uh, lives. So, so let's talk a bit more about these different kinds of, of worlds and different kinds of plants. So these are these... Um, so-called ancient plants, uh, they're still with us. So they are quite modern in their own way, but they've been around for quite a long time. Um, and these are liverworts and hornworts. And if you look in a, in a textbook, uh, they'll show you that they have this part up, up at the top that is green. They have a bottom part where they interact with their substrate. And then they have these uh, cells in the middle that look like they're just plant cells. It turns out that in the real world, 
these plants are much more interesting than that. If you look at these cells here, they are typically filled with fungal filaments, um, hyphae. So here you've got these ones that look like little tree branch structures. These ones that look like really big balls of yarn. And these are living plant cells filled with living fungal cells, okay? Now these are today. Um, this is sort of a, a snapshot from the time machine. This is a fossil. This is uh, very ancient. This is 410 million years ago. This is from Scotland. These are the most exquisitely preserved fossils that have ever been found. Um, and here, um, there's an ecosystem that essentially turned to glass. This is a little town near a little town called Rhiney. And uh, here you see one plant cell, another plant cell, another plant cell here. And you might make out that there are these uh, threads connecting them and then all these branched uh, filaments in here. So these look somewhat like this. Um, and so if you use your imagination, then this could be considered ancient fungi that go along with this ancient plant. So, We've been working on this for about 10 years. We started this uh, and I'm not gonna bore you with uh, all of the different papers that we published at this. I'm just gonna give you sort of a, a, a cartoon that we're gonna kind of decorate with the bits of information that we have uh, currently available. But this is really quite recent. It is a work in progress in some way. Um, so here we've got our timeline. So from the present back into uh, the very beginnings of terrestrial uh, ecosystems. And here we have, um, aquatic organisms that then make that jump into land. This is the conquest of land. And that is thought now to coincide with the evolution of symbiosis with fungi. Notice that this happens well before plants have seeds, well before they have roots, even well before they have stomata. These are like little openings on leaves that allow plants to exchange um, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the fossils provide some information to support this, um, this kind of uh, uh, evolutionary tree. Um, here's the famous uh, Rhiney chart, um, but we sort of run out of fossils the further back we go. Um, so you do have to use uh, other sources of information in that sort of ready source of information are the plants that are still left with us, which are quite a few different lineages, probably many went extinct, but this is what we still have today. Things like flowering plants, uh, pines, ferns, uh, and others. So another thing to point out is the evolution of forests. Um, so this is something that, you know, through plant evolution, plants get bigger uh, above ground and below ground, and they start building up soils, and they start to need roots to explore those soils that they built up. So the very first forest probably looked around sort of like this, um, and there are some uh, very large uh, trunk fossils of these in places like New York State. So... The question now that you've invented something called soil is how do you deal with it? And roots are gonna be part of the solution um, because they go into the ground. Roots have these structures uh, that come off them, these little fingers uh, that are called root hairs. And these um, are what allow plants to get in the little crevices in the soil and sort of mine for resources. However, these are somewhat limited. So they are fairly short. They are quite thick and they're formed by a single cell. So each one of these is only one cell. Fungi, on the other hand, uh, had been on land already, uh, and they have a whole other set of characteristics that make them more uh, readily adapted to investigate, explore, mine in this very complex soil environment. So they can become very, very long, many meters. Uh, they are very, very thin. They are composed of many, many cells. They can branch. Uh, they can also fuse, come back together and make a network. And we all love networks, right? Networks are very efficient. Um, and they can also release a whole lot of enzymes to kind of digest things and make them simpler compounds and bring them into their, their cells. So if you can bring these two together, plants with roots and fungi, then you probably have a winning combination. Um, and that's just what happens. So you've got this kind of classic plant root that we learn about in, in school. Uh, and in the real world, it turns out the roots look more interesting than that. So in here, you've got a grass root and it's got all this sort of spaghetti looking stuff. These are all these filaments that are growing in and out of 
uh, these plant cells. And if you zoom inside of one of the plant cells, you might see this structure that looks like a little tree. So it's very branched. You get this on herbaceous plants, also in, in woody shrubs and uh, some trees as well. This fungi just grow into the soil and then make spores. More recently, as soils became deeper and more developed, new kinds of uh, associations evolved to exploit those environments. Um, and these are these, uh, these type of association where the root becomes completely enveloped like a glove with fungi. So in here, you got a little birch seedling. Uh, it's got two cotyledons and it's got the first leaf, but it's already got several roots. This root here already uh, it, it still has um, root hairs on it. These roots have been transformed into this mycorrhiza, uh, this type of um, symbiosis. So this you get mainly on, on woody plants, on trees, uh, and this fun grow into the soil from the roots, and then they make either truffles or mushrooms. So... To make this uh, very blunt, we could claim that plants don't really have roots. They have fungi roots or mycorrhizas. Uh, mycorrhizas, ter tremendously terrible word. You know, it's almost impossible to spell and pronounce. I wish we could just say fungi roots, uh, but there you go. That's what we've got. Um, this, these ones we call endo because they're inside. Um, they're mainly associated with phosphorus uptake, one of the limited nutrients for plant growth. And these ones uh, are called ecto because they cover the outside um, and they're mainly associated with nitrogen uptake, uh, which is another limiting nutrient for plant growth. So then we get this, this nice diagram here. Uh, and this is this idea of this uh, connections between different plants. Uh, by these different fungi that are growing on the roots and, and, and in the soil. So we can map out what different groups of fungi we've got. Uh, it's not a free for all. There are certain fungi that are adapted to work with certain fungi and with, with certain plants and vice versa. Uh, not, everything, not every combination has succeeded. Probably every combination has been tried in this very, very long uh, timeline, but only some of them have been successful. Um, and we've gotten some uh, publicity for this. So uh, it's ended up in uh, some prestigious scientific journals. Uh, and there's even a documentary made about this, How Fungi Made Our World. Um, and you can watch this online. So this story that I just told you about, uh, it is certainly cost for celebration. Um, it greened the land. Uh, it formed soils um, and uh, some fossil fuels like coal. Uh, in that process, it decarbonized uh, and oxygenated the air uh, and uh, promoted the diversification of the fungi, the plants associated with, and ultimately of, of animals. Hooray! It probably doesn't escape your, uh, your noticing that we are very much in the process of reversing almost all of these processes, um, which took many millions of years, uh, and we are doing that in an with an astonishing speed. So we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later. So just so you don't think that this is all a sort of happy, happy kind of a, a world where everybody gets along, there is some cheating going on here in these kinds of uh, uh, networks. So here we've got this setup um, where you've got uh, a plant here. There's another plant here. They're green. They're photosynthetic. Uh, there may be different species. They got these different fungi that they're connected with, and they got this direction bi-directional arrows uh, to indicate that there's a fair exchange. So I give you, let's say, sugars. You give me back soil minerals. Okay. So that's how this is. This is normally how most ecosystems work. There are all these connections going on. Now, notice that in here you've got this fungus in particular that is actually connected to both of these plants. Okay. So this sets up. Uh, a situation that is potentially dangerous, okay? Because this plant could uh, have a problem. Uh, it could mutate. It could become a, a non-photosynthetic plant. Um, and then the arrow now is pointing in only one direction, okay? So this plant is going to provide sugars to this fungus, and then this fungus is going to provide sugars to this plant, okay? So that gets an exclamation mark. Uh, this is not just a, a theory. This actually happens. Uh, and I will worked on this for quite a few years and it got me quite a lot of press from the sort of a, a sort of science paparazzi, let's call it. Um, and people I think are quite interested in this kind of a, a devious 
deviousness in in the natural world maybe it, it makes us feel better about ourselves but people are talking about liaisons dangerous and mutualist and mutualistic uh, breakdown and good relationships going bad and things like that okay so let me show you an example of this uh, we'll do one from north america and another one from uh, europe so this is a red pine this is a, a very nice looking mushroom uh, a rushula, the copper brittle girl and this one um, associates with this plant called the indian pipe so this is, is it just has a root system and flowers there's nothing else these grow in very dark uh, forests typically um, if you look at how these plants look when they're growing up um, here you've got a seed. They make the smallest of all seeds in vast numbers. So there's one tiny little seed there. This whole thing here is a couple of centimeters long. Um, and that uh, germinates and starts to grow into this branch structure. So this is a plant that is chest roots, okay? Uh, and it is colored uh, orange because that's the color of the fungus that is covering it. Eventually, uh, it sort of remembers that it should grow up above ground um, and it cracks that uh, glove and it produces a flower bud that then develops into one of these pretty flowers. Um, here in, in Europe, we have this one, um, this uh, Gross and Scott's pine. Uh, it likes this fungi called Tricholoma. And uh, these ones are called the Dutchman's pipe or Monotropa. And these plants uh, in about 2005 in the UK became red listed. Uh, they are uh, considered in danger because they've been through a very prolonged population decline. And the idea here that I'm going to put out, and we'll come back to this much later, is that uh, perhaps these kinds of forests or this fungi or the, the relationship between this, this forest and these trees and, and this fungi uh, has some kind of problem uh, in that uh, these, are, these plants are sort of a canary in the coal mine. They're telling us that there's something going uh, wrong in this kind of system. Okay, so hold on to that thought. So now we'll talk about uh, tipping. And this is the idea of tipping points and ecosystems. So, you're probably all aware that we are doing the biggest experiment ever. We are all totally into it. Um, and uh, this has a few different aspects. Uh, the one that gets the most attention is adding more carbon. Um, so we take uh, carbon that plants and other organisms stored over millions of years uh, in uh, the Earth's crust, and we burn it off to get energy. Uh, and that ends up in the biosphere and then we just kind of sit back and see what happens. Uh, this is a very successful, unfortunately, kind of experiment. Um, and this is from uh, uh, the, the records of, of, of CO2 in Mauna Loa, the volcano that is now uh, erupting. And here you can see um, that the CO2 levels are uh, shooting right up. And so historically, there would have been about two to 300 ppm uh, of CO2 in the air, parts per million. And now we are at 410 and, and rising. Um, so even though this experiment is very poorly designed because there's no replicates and there's no controls, so scientifically it's a bad experiment, it's actually very effective. Uh, the other part of the experiment is that we add more nitrogen. We are all involved in this um, and this come partly from fossil fuels and also uh, to a great extent uh, from the burning of fossil fuels to make fertilizers okay, for our crops so that they can grow faster. And so that also ends up in the biosphere and then we sit back and see what happens. Uh, and there are effects here. Now, this is not a, a gas form, this is ions. So it doesn't get distributed through the whole uh, atmosphere. Uh, this gets concentrated in certain places. Uh, this has a lot to do with wind and, and precipitation. And so uh, in some parts of the world, we still have pre-industrial levels, but in many other parts of the world, we are well beyond anything that organisms ever experienced. So we would have started with about zero of this. And now in some places we are up to 50 or even more uh, kilograms per hectare per year being added. So you might imagine that this might have some consequences. And for instance, if we think about trees, this seems to do so. So in um, uh, some years ago, uh, there was a study of um, basically it's a, it's a health check on the leaves or needles of trees across Europe. And what you find is that their 
mineral nutrition is deteriorating. So they have too much or too little of certain compounds. The UK is included in this um, uh, sampling here. And you might imagine that this would have some effects on the ability of these trees to to capture carbon for us uh, in providing us with wood uh, and in the resilience to pests and or to drought. Now, we do notice that there's a problem above ground, uh, but then we are faced with this issue of this sort of black box below ground. So maybe there's something going on there that is the problem, but it's much harder to study that. So let's see what, what we can do about that. So um, you are probably aware from the, the last COP and the most recent one, um, there's, there's a lot of focus on trees and forests as a, as a way to solve some of the problems or at least try to manage some of the problems that we are having with uh, uh, excess carbon in the air. And um, there is this declaration, I think 140 something countries agreed to this, that uh, we, you know, we need to have use forests or, or, or think about forests uh, allowing us to achieve this balance between gas emissions uh, and removal. Um, and there is quite a lot of focus on forest creation, protection and restoration. And this is something that people in the tree council will certainly know quite a lot about. Um, and these are often the only really large scale proven approaches for carbon sequestration that we still have. So let's come back to, to roots. We are, we're heading below ground. So just to remind you, trees don't have roots. They have mycorrhizas. Trees don't interact directly with the soil. They only do that through fungi. And if we think of a tree uh, as a sort of power source, right? The above ground part is capturing energy from the sun, then it could be sort of analogous to this power tool, right? And this power tool is not gonna be very effective in your environment, in your, in your house or in your work uh, shed. Um, this, uh, unless it has a good set of attachments, right? That allow it to do things. And you could think of the tree in a, in a similar sense, uh, needing to have a good set of uh, diverse set of fungi that allow it to do different things in the environment. And these fungi, as you can see, they all look different. They all have different characteristics, different things that they can do better or worse, uh, uh, depending on the conditions in the, in the soil. So maybe there's something going on with them. Now, we cannot just look this up. Um, this, we have, you know, very limited uh, ideas about distribution and status of the fungi. They, they're hidden away in the soil. Uh, it's not as easy as with animals and plants to, to get uh, information about what, they, you know, what they're going through. Uh, this is nothing really new. Uh, in the 1500s, Leonardo was saying, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies and about the soil underneath. And that is still very much the case. Um, and this has consequences. Um, I'll talk about Europe and then I'll talk about the UK. So this is uh, Europe when the UK was still part of uh, the EU. So there was in 2000, this water framework directive. Um, and this uh, requires a very careful monitoring for biology, chemistry, and physics of uh, the uh, water. Water you can see through it. It's very nice, very convenient to work with. Um, air, again, you can see through it um, and it's easy to, to sample. So um, in 2008, there's a follow-up directive. This is called the Air Quality uh, Framework Directive. And this has also uh, requires monitoring for various kinds of air pollutants. Uh, in 2014, the sort of natural thing would be to, to then do something about soil. Um, this one failed. Um, and although it was recognized that soil degradation was a serious challenge. So this one never uh, uh, was implemented. These two are working uh, and are being applied and you know, governments and companies have to uh, pay attention to them. Um, consequences in the UK. Um, so this is uh, just from last year. So this is from Natural England. As you probably are aware, we, we need to understand where the carbon is, okay? And soils in particular are where most of the carbon is uh, sequestered and in, in from where a lot of emissions actually come from. Uh, so there's a lot more carbon in the soil than in the vegetation and the air combined. Um, so there's this report from Natural England um, and it's about carbon storage by habitat. Um, and if you look, if you read through it, uh, plants are mentioned quite frequently. Fungi are only mentioned once, and this is about lichens actually, it's not about soil fungi. Uh, and mycorrhizae are never mentioned, okay? 
So that uh, suggests that there might be a problem here in, in uh, our, the information that we have available. Um, so how can we get around this? How can we understand the underground? So the idea here, and this is sort of my, my wish list, um, is here, and it has all these different components in it, these things that I would like to have to be able to understand what's going on. And most scientists would probably agree that th these are the kinds of things that we need uh, in, a, in a wish list. Um, but it might sound like a bit of a fantasy until we real realize that some of these things actually are already available. Um, so there is this network called ICP Forest. This is a, a, the UK's part of this as well. It's a United Nations um, a treaty. And uh, these people have sort of written the book on how to monitor forests. Um, and this involves a lot of deployment of equipment in, in monitoring plots. Uh, and from a scientific point of view, this is really a, a gold mine. Um, so the question then becomes chest whether we can do this fungal kind of analysis in the soil. Okay, so that's kind of the big question. And a lot of people would say, hopeless, it's just too difficult, try to find some alternative. But we we decided to, to do it. It took quite a lot of convincing, uh, but we eventually managed to get a bit of money to do this. Um, and we just, we went for it. Um, so there are some of the people that work with this. Uh, Philippa did a PhD, Laura did a postdoc and still working on this very actively. Uh, and Sietze did a, a postdoc on this. And these are the papers that they published. So basically, uh, in, in a, to summarize this, uh, we were able to manage uh, nearly 140 uh, different plots, this are a quarter hectare each. Um, we measured, a, we were able to get data, we actually didn't have to measure them ourselves. We could get a lot of data from this monitoring network. Uh, and we collected a whole lot of soil samples uh, and uh, investigated uh, an incredible number of uh, individual uh, mycorrhizal roots. So, We've had a lot of meetings with people from different uh, government agencies and, and various scientists to discuss what, what could be done or could not be done with this kind of data. Um, and there was a lot of agreement that we need to have this uh, response curves to global change. It's really how we can understand what's going on. And once we have that, we can do different kinds of statistical analysis that lead us into things that are useful for people that are doing policy and, and management, like critical loads and, and tipping points. So that's that's what we are aiming for. So a health check of trees can involve a lot of things. This is like when you go to the, the doctor and you do a blood test and you know they tell you, yeah, this is this is in the green, this is in the red, this is something that you should look at. Um, and so you can do things like this um, with, uh, with the above ground parts of trees and you can get lots of information. Uh, I'm only gonna focus on a couple of these. So I'm gonna look at uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, and nitrogen uh, pollution. But there's a lot of other things that we could say about some of the others. And these are some of these kinds of plots with the various kinds of equipment to collect information in them. So this is one of these uh, uh, response curves. This is what, what they can look like. So in here, you've got, it looks very complicated, but actually it's, it's not that bad. So in this direction, we increase uh, nitrogen pollution. This is coming through the air from, from uh, rain mainly uh, or snow. And you've got these two curves. So these ones are, uh, each dot is a different plot. Um, and these in black are the represent the fungi that are most negatively affected. These ones in white are the fungi that are uh, more tolerant of this pollution. And initially, nitrogen works as a fertilizer, even for these kinds of systems. So this is when you are at sort of pre-industrial level. So this is mainly going to be in places like some places in Scotland or, or Scandinavia. Um, but eventually, it just gets to be a bit too much and they crash. Okay, and even the ones that are more tolerant, they eventually sort of get to a point where they they begin to to experience uh, losses of diversity. So mycorrhizae are affected by this. Um, if you are looking at uh, the pre-industrial levels down here, and you look at what we have in England, we are well beyond anything that is sort of uh, what these organisms evolved for. Okay, so we've created this kind of Frankenstein kind of environments, and that's what these organisms are having to cope with. Okay, so another way of looking at this with additional data is to look at uh, tree nutrition. Okay, and trying to link that at a very large scale, so this is across all of Europe, um, with the diversity of fungi in the roots of these trees. And so you get this uh, very colorful graph here, um, and here you've got the nutritional status of the trees. 
Um, and in here, you got an indication of how diverse their fungal uh, communities are on, on their mycorrhizae are on their on their um, root systems. And so you get this uh, kind of curve here. Uh, most of the, you cannot see all of them. Some of them are very dark, um, but they are each one of the 137 plots in here. Uh, most of the ones in, in England are here. Uh, this, that one is up in Scotland. Um, and each one of the different countries is, is noted by the, the two letter code. So if you look at what is considered uh, a balanced nutrition for trees like uh, spruce, uh, pine, beech, oak, um, which are the dominant trees in, in, in Europe uh, and in the UK, then um, you find that that is within this range, okay? So when you're beyond that, then you're having uh, uh, potentially problems with the nutrition in those trees. And that links with this idea of the tipping points, okay? So a tipping point is something that uh, you once you cross it, you get accelerated change. Uh, and it is very, very easy to move away downhill from it. And it's extremely difficult to climb back up. And in fact, you might not be able to climb back up. That's sort of an open question, uh, whether you can actually recover that uh, initial condition, okay? So that's something that, that we need to do a lot more uh, thinking about. So the, the idea here is that you've got a variety of fungi that uh, are uh, not coping with these new conditions that we created. And there's a variety of fungi that are coping uh, fairly well. It doesn't take a mycorrhizal uh, specialist to notice that these here on the right look very different from these ones on the left. So these ones are very hairy. Uh, this pump a lot of carbon into the soil, something that we love, right? This is exactly what we want them to be doing. Take carbon from the trees and pump it into the soil. These ones are a bit lazier, okay? So these ones, uh, they cover the root, um, but they just let nutrients come to them, okay? These live in places where there's quite a lot of nutrients available that we've made through uh, pollution. And you might remember our plant that was on its way out, at least in the UK, uh, that one is associated with a fungus that it's itself on its way out. So it's not coping well with these new uh, conditions that we've created. So to wrap things up, um, hopefully I've convinced you that it, it is possible to understand the underground, however hidden and uh, locked away in the soil it might be. So we can get a, a snapshot uh, what we want to aim for next is try to take multiple snapshots so we can see um, rate of change over time. And this is really quite critical uh, if we are going to know where we are at with this uh, bit of, of, a, of a time bomb uh, of these ecosystems crossing these this tipping points uh, and then be more difficult to, to recover. It's easier to do it once you're uh, before the tipping point. So, so what is next? Um, trying to predict uh, both below and above ground change. They are linked. Trying to avert this crossing of tipping points and trying to find ways of recovering our forests. So some of the ways in which we are trying to head in this direction, uh, it is extremely difficult to get uh, funding to do this kind of work, um, but uh, things are changing. So this is in 2019, uh, we got together with this um, charity called the Carbon Community. This is a trial in Wales where mycorrhizae are being included in the trials. This is uh, exciting and new. Um, in 2021, so just last year, at Wakehurst Place, which is uh, sort of Kew's uh, wild botanic garden in, in Sussex. Um, we started a, a new study here, uh, both above and below ground. And this also includes mycorrhizae. Uh, this, again, this is not the kind of thing that would have happened even five years ago, 10 years ago, no way. Uh, but I think people are starting to realize that these uh, mycorrhizae play a role in these environments, uh, particularly having to do with uh, carbon um, sequestration and storage. So, um, so this is this is in progress. And just this year, um, we've started to include uh, mycorrhizae in uh, a new initiative, which is the NCEA or Natural Capital and Ecosystem Assessment. It's a, a government uh, initiative to uh, map um, conditions, uh, biological and chemical and physical 
in uh, one by one kilometer plots, uh, and it's a very large number across all habitats um, in England. Uh, and this is uh, very much happening, and, and it's it's really exciting that this is now finally happening. And with that, I can uh, close. I can thank the Tree Council for inviting me to talk to you. Uh, I can thank a lot of people and in, in, uh, students and institutions and some of the funders uh, here and uh, the happy, smiley people that have uh, gotten uh, PhDs and, and other kinds of degrees through this. Uh, and um, Laura is still very involved with this, uh, working at Q. Most of these other guys have moved into other uh, kinds of jobs. Uh, Jill is also very involved with these kinds of projects still at Q. And um, I think that's it. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask now, uh, or you can send me an email. Um, in almost all of the papers that uh, we've uh, published, including some that are for a more general audience, not, not all of them are for other scientists, are available freely on a platform called ResearchGate. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Martin. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to give, he's been keeping an eye on the questions. If we could unshare the screen, I think probably, yeah, fabulous. Yep. Thank you, Martin. So we've got lots of questions um, we can pick our way through. So um, there's an interesting one that came in almost at the beginning. Somebody said, do you think it will take fungi as long to evolve the capacity to break down plastics? as it did to break down plants? Yeah, um, not my area, um, but there are, there, I have seen some papers go by about fungi breaking things down, uh, including plastics. Uh, this is the idea of sort of bioremediation. Uh, a lot of the focus traditionally has been on bacteria. Uh, bacteria have an extraordinary repertoire of, of enzymes and things that they can do. Um, however, bacteria really work very well in sort of wet kind of environments where they can sort of swim around. Fungi, uh, their thing is that they can live in places that are drier, so they can actually cross air gaps, uh, which is something that bacteria have a really hard time doing. So in that sense, then fungi do have an advantage uh, over bacteria in degrading things like plastics. Um, but that's probably as far as I will go. I, I it's it's not really my area. Fine, it just struck me as a really unusual twist on it. Yeah, question, which, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of threads about um, about uh, the issues of nitrogen dioxide in the north and whether the air is better in the north than it is in the south, or whether it's the fertilization of the fields that's made a difference. Yeah. So the fertilizing fields uh, and then having runoff of water into water bodies. That's something that is pretty well understood. Um, what I'm mainly focusing here is where nitrogen actually goes up into the air and then it, it sort of rains on in forests. And this can happen very far from roads and very far from cities. So for instance, in the UK, you get quite a lot of this in Wales. Uh, central parts of Wales, uh, and that's you know quite far away from areas where there are you know big cities and lots of roads, and that's because of you know topography and, and precipitation and wind patterns. So it's it's not necessarily right next to where people are or right next to where you have agricultural fields. In fact, it can be quite far away from them. Um, places where you really have truly let's say pre-industrial levels, um, you really have to go to Scandinavia uh, or pretty remote parts of Scotland. Uh, and I'm talking extremely low levels of pollution. Uh, right. So things you know below five kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, in anywhere in England, you would be very hard pressed to find anything even remotely close to that. Uh, but, you know, I, th I think this is where it's useful to kind of remember how long this, these plants and this fungi have been around. You know, we showed up yesterday and we started reversing the, their decarbonization process with our recarbonization process. So 
their evolution for 500 million years has been all about things like trying to get desperately nitrogen, okay? And then we come in yesterday and we just dump piles of it on them. So of course, it's going to have an effect. However, because it's in the soil, it's taking quite a long time to understand really what's going on. Uh, in fact, as you saw, we started sort of noticing the problem above ground, um, even though it's something that is really happening in the soil. So, so yeah, uh, a lot could be said about that. I don't think we are yet making decisions about where to maximize tree planting for carbon sequestration based on this kind of information. I don't think we are quite there yet. So, so that links to, um, to another question that we've been asked, um, which was by Carol Ann, who said, does tree growth slow if fungicides are applied to the soil? Ah, good question. Yeah, so, so it depends on who you ask. So many people will claim that um, soil is very complex. There's a lot of diversity in there. There's a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of fungi. Uh, and a lot of them will eventually break down almost anything that you give to them, including things like fungicides. Um, and so that, that will sort of protect a lot of the soil residents from being exposed to high levels of these. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure how much of that is based on opinion and how much is, of that is based on evidence. Uh, again, because these are not easy systems to study. Soil is tough, it's, it's dark, you know, basically. Uh, so I, I wonder, um, I, I, it's, again, it's not the kind of thing that I've worked on um, because most of these forests are not really exposed to that. You, you would have to be very close to agricultural fields to get that kind of exposure. Um, but, uh, but very valid question. Very interesting question. Yeah. So, so Jill and Rob say, I'm sort of following on from that thought, mm -hmm. does, does any of the soil, does it matter the, does the soil type actually affect the diversity and range of, of, of fungi? Yes. Certainly, certainly. Um, so remember when I was talking about these two types, the ecto and the endo. So the the really ancient ones, uh, the endo type, um, those tend to be mainly about phosphorus uptake. They tend to be very dominant in less well developed soils. Um, and the ecto ones tend to be more active and more diverse in places where you have really deep, you know, thick, dark, you know, sort of forest soils, um, because that's what they've evolved for. And those, are, those soils typically are very low in nitrogen. Um, interestingly, there are a few trees that can switch. So it's sort of the ACDC or best of both worlds kind of uh, approach. However, they don't normally have those two types of fungi at the same time. So let's say it's a eucalyptus or a willow. Um, those can do both, but they will often have the endo, the, the phosphorus giver for the undeveloped soils when they are seedlings, when they are young. Right. And when they are very mature and they kind of develop a soil around them with their litter and their dead roots, then they are exclusively ecto because then they become nitrogen limited. Um, so again, you know, these are very finely tuned uh, kinds of systems. Uh, and, and then we just sort of show up and mess with them. Uh, but, uh, but they, yeah, they, they, there, is, uh, there are different, definitely uh, differences depending on soil types. Uh, however, I will say this, for the, the study that I was just talking about, the European wide study, we include, of course, soil type in the analysis. In nitrogen, was a much more important driver or control or, or factor in the diversity of this fungi, uh, even than the soil type. And you can imagine, you know, across UK, the UK and all of Europe, there's some very different kinds of soil types. Uh, and yet, nitrogen pollution was the dominant driver of the diversity. So that, that was kind of a wake up call for us. So, so one, of, one of the audience um, 
says, as a small woodland owner, is there anything that they can actually do to help the fungi in their woods? Yeah, so if you have established woods, um, a lot of these systems, you know, because they're, they're network formers, they're not very keen on disturbance, you know, physical disturbance. So anytime you compact the soil, anytime that you pull out root systems, anytime that you plow or do anything like that, you definitely are going to have reductions in the diversity of this fungi. Um, and it's not just below ground, you know, you could monitor the, the mushrooms uh, of this fungi. And not, not all mushrooms come from this fungi, but a good number of them in woods do. Uh, you could even probably notice it through looking at the diversity of, of, of the mushrooms. Um, so, so definitely uh, th there, are, there are things that you can do your forest that will work against them. Uh, you get the greatest diversity with, you know, old trees and unpolluted areas uh, that are not disturbed. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, if, if you have any kind of nature reserves nearby, uh, if you can, you know, maybe plant trees ar around the edges so that then those fungi can expand, all of those kinds of things are highly, highly valuable for sure. And one of the simplest things, is, as we know, you know 90 percent of much of the biodiversity of a wood is associated with dead wood yeah. so one of the things that we can all do a huge amount is not to be too tidy Absolutely. it's not to take away the dead wood leave the right. trees lying leave the trees right. fallen even right. potentially fell a few trees right but leave them to decompose because all of that provides nutrients for the right right we uh, some years ago we we were lucky to work in um in this forest in british columbia um, and they are this giant Sitka, I mean, they're gi ginormous trees. It's, it's extraordinary. This is the Olympic Peninsula in, in Washington. Um, and there are this incredible, um, th these trees fall down and then you get these seedlings of the same trees that establish on the rotting wood. But because they are establishing preferentially on the fallen logs, then you actually get trees growing in, in rows even though it's not planted. So it, it's, it's incredibly cool. Um, if you look at the fungi that are in, the, in that rotten wood that is becoming soil in the roots of the seedlings and in the trees, there are fungi that are specialized to be on that rotten wood. So you get this kind of micro ecosystem within that forest. Uh, it, it, it's just brilliant. Yeah, if you ever get to go around there, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, really it's, amazing. It's, they're, they're, they're temperate rainforests. Yes, it's only one, one of the only coniferous rainforests on the planet. Yeah, it? it's amazing. It's amazing. It has, the, has those truly astonishing yellow banana slugs, if you ever yeah, get there, Yeah, anyway. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. amazing, amazing, yeah. So we've got a couple of questions from Geraldine and others who are asking about whether it's worth um, adding. There's a lot of Ah, add mycorrhizae to soil. Right. Whether that's a good idea or not. Right. Yeah. Um, ooh, that's that's a big question. Um I I would be skeptical. Okay. I think I think you're doing a an experiment and you should treat it as such. Experiments sometimes work, sometimes they don't work, sometimes you don't know if it worked. Uh, and that's the same case here. Um, I mentioned earlier that this fungi are you know, again, it's very fine tuned. This is one of the oldest, probably the oldest symbiosis we know about. So it is very fine tuned. So not every combination of plant and fungus works. Okay. Um, so when you, you know, if, if you look at the label of these, they'll tell you that they'll work on every plant that that's, there's no way. Okay. Um, so you, you do have to be careful with that. Um, I, I also have noticed that in, in many of them, uh, it's not just fungi or spores or roots that they put in there. Sometimes it's fertilizer or there's little granules that hold water or things like that. So they are, they are more complicated than just the mycorrhizal inoculum. I'm not saying that they're all bad or that they're all good. I'm just kind of giving an opinion here. Uh, it's not something that I actually investigated myself, but, but I, I would be skeptical. Uh, and, and I would treat this as an, as an experiment. Uh, some of these are quite expensive. They're, they're mainly targeted at, at sort of like horticultural kind of high value kinds of plants. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an open question. Yeah. 
So I think I think my take home from that is treat with caution, but it might be worth a go if you can compare and contrast. Absolutely. And if Absolutely. you do, we want to know. So tell us if you get something to work and it works. Absolutely. We would be, we would Absolutely. All be really I, I think that the three main issues here is what plant you've got, what fungus you're putting onto it, in what soil or what kind of environment you're dealing with, you know. In, in that combination will vary depending on whose garden or whose field you are in. Uh, so, so you should expect that because it worked for John and might not work for Sarah, even though they tried it under the same roses, uh, because they just happen to have a different soil type or because the it was wetter or drier. So the, it's a pretty complex experiment actually, um, but yeah. And and on that note, I, uh, um, I'm going to pass yeah. this back to Sarah because we're almost up against time. There are so many questions that we didn't get to answer, everybody. But thank you for posing them. Um, and I'm sorry if I didn't manage to cover all of them, Sarah. So, so just to say thank you again so much, Martin. You made a, a very complex subject, very accessible, and it was very uh, colourful and. Um, yeah, fantastic presentation. I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say a huge, huge thank you. And I very much hope that we'll we'll you know do things together again in the future. Um, I wanted to thank the Tree Council team as well. I wanted to thank uh, John for helping with the questions, for for Dom uh, for for doing all the really important technology and spreading the word about the webinar. And thank you to all of you. You have been a fantastic audience, one of our very largest. Uh, and it's been been lovely to be to be with you. Thank you for caring for the trees and the fun guy. Um, I hope you'll all enjoy the rest of National Tree Week. And if you've enjoyed the sessions tonight, please tell everybody that you know that the Tree Council is taking part in this year's um, Big Give Christmas Challenge, uh, which runs until next Tuesday. And every penny that is given will go towards our Orchards uh, for Schools programme. And any money that you give will be doubled. So it'll be double the amount of fruit trees going into schools. I know that Dom is going to put, or maybe already has put, the, the link in the chat box. So do take it away. We're 70% of the way to our target of 20K um, for Orchards for Schools. So thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Um, have a really lovely rest of the evening and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much. Goodbye.